So as Dan mentioned, I'll be giving an update on the June Sucker Recovery Implementation Program. I work for the Utah Division of Wildlife, but uh, serve as the director of the June Sucker Program. Let's start off with a brief timeline here. Um, back in 1889, the first uh, fish survey was conducted on Utah Lake by David Starr Jordan. And he declared Utah Lake the greatest sucker pond in the universe. <laughs> in 1980, less than 100 years later, uh, June sucker were listed as an endangered species due to lack of recruitment. By the early 90s, June suckers were precariously near extinction, and they remained only as rapidly shrinking. An aging remnant population without success, recent successful reproduction. By the late 90s, when I started working on June, June sucker, we had a population of about 300 individuals, and that's all there was. What was going on in, in the lake? We, we had these aged adults that were still coming in and successfully spawning and producing young uh, June sucker. But these young fish didn't live past 20 years of age. They're 20 days of age. And that's about the time when um, they, they finish up feeding off their yolk sac and have to start actively feeding. In 2002, a group of stakeholders got together and they formed the June Sucker Recovery Implementation Program. The program had two goals. One, to recover June suckers so that it no longer needed the protection of the Endangered Species Act. And the other was to allow for continued operation of existing water facilities and uh, future development of water resources for human use. The important point here is that the, the program, as long as it is making sufficient progress towards recovery, serves as the Endangered Species Act compliance for water development in the drainage. So, to, the species was threatened with imminent extinction, and we did some triage. Uh, we collected some of these old individuals. These fish were 40 years old, coming in to spawn. We, we collected them on the banks of Provo River, artificially spawned them, and it raised some fish in our hatchery system. Uh, we raised them up to about 8 inches. We put them back out in the lake. They survived, they grew, and they returned to the uh, adult spawning population. So we averted the extinction early on in the program. But we still had this uh, bottleneck in this early life stage of uh, the fish. And uh, the program operates on the best available science and makes their decisions based on that. But we didn't have a lot of science pertaining to Utah Lake or to uh, the June sucker. So we're really heavy into the research in the early stages of the program. One of the first things we did to, um, to benefit this early life stage was develop some flow targets and start acquiring water for the lower Provo River. Uh, we developed these flow targets. They're ecosystem based and they're based on the natural hydrology of the Provo River. And they're also uh, adaptable for, for different conditions for a given water year. We also started looking at developing habitat for these young fish. The tributaries coming into Utah Lake had all been channelized to allow uh, for water delivery and reduce flood impacts. And we went in to restore some of the habitat complexity that these early life stages needed. Here's a picture of Hobble Creek, which was restored in 2008. And uh, we uh, actually reconnected the creek with the, the lake. Within uh, the, the first spring after that restoration, we had June sucker come in to spawn. And that winter, we had the first uh, documented overwinter survival of, June, of naturally produced June sucker in the system. I won't talk about this because Melissa's going to share some information there. When we started looking at the lake, uh, and seeing what was wrong out there, we knew there was a dominance of carp out in the lake. The, the biomass, the, the fish biomass uh, in Utah Lake was comprised of 90% uh, common carp, 
which are a non-native species that were introduced to uh, help uh, supplement food supplies back in the 1880s. But as early as 1900, uh, Fish Commissioner Tullian visited Utah Lake and he said the carp had thriven immensely. They'd eaten off all the mosses and similar growth along the bottom of the lake so that the trout had not had enough to eat. So the program, what, what you end up with when you have carp in a system is uh, they really simplify the system by eliminating all the aquatic macrophytes. So you end up with a system where primary productivity is driven by algae. Your invertebrate community is uh, predominantly made up of benthic invertebrates like the midges here on the left and then uh, certainly the, the dominant carp population. We entered into a large-scale carp removal effort, the biggest ever in the world, and uh, we successfully achieved our target in 2018 of a 75% reduction in the carp biomass in the lake. And this is equivalent to 123 blue whales in biomass, and that's the biggest animal in the world there. <laughs> So what's our response? Well, at June Sucker today, there's tens of thousands of these fish in Utah Lake. And just uh, this year, the fish was downlisted from endangered to threatened. Huge milestone for the uh, program. So now we're focusing on delisting, de but we have to understand and recognize that June Sucker is what's termed a conservation-reliant species, and that even after delisting, we're going to still have to uh, implement management actions to keep that population healthy out there. So just some important points to wrap up. Uh, the June Sucker Program serves as the ESA compliance for water development in the drainage. And the program has made significant investments in Utah Lake in the recovery of June Sucker, which resulted in the recent downlisting. We're on track for recovery and delisting, de recognizing that ongoing management will be required once the species is delisted. And that's all I have. Here's my contact information.